Okay, um, we're going to get started now. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I am Diane Paulsell. I am a portfolio lead in SEP for those of you who don't know me, and I'm really excited about the session today. I'm going to say just a quick word about the social determinants of health affinity group and then introduce our speaker, John Auerbach. So APT has a strong commitment for staff to work across accounts and divisions to grow APT's thinking around the social determinants of health. Um, you know, we're doing really similar work across our divisions with similar populations, and there's a lot of opportunities to see how issues intersect across our focus areas and make conscious efforts um, to have a holistic approach. Um, so the social determinants of health affinity group is working to facilitate this through a variety of activities. They're gonna be hosting four lightning rounds in FY21, highlighting at social determinants of health work with themes for each lightning round. They're developing a slip sheet they're identifying and cataloging apps capabilities related to social determinants of health, and they're identifying leaders working in the area of social determinants of health, as well as key organizations that are leading in this area and articles and resources um, that we can use for business development and other kinds of activities. So I'm really excited to introduce our speaker today. Um, John Auerbach is president and CEO of Trust for America's Health. Um, as such, he oversees the trust work to promote sound public health policy and make disease prevention a national priority. And over the course of his 30 year career, he's held a number of senior public health positions at the federal, state and local levels, including associate director at the CDC, commissioner of public wealth for Mass public health for Massachusetts and uh, Boston's health commissioner for nine years. And he was previously a professor of practice in health sciences and director of the Institute of Urban Health Research and Practice at Northeastern University. Um, so welcome, John. We're really excited about this session today and I turn the floor over to you. Great. Well. Thank you so much and hello to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be talking about this issue. Um, I have a variety of slides and I'm gonna go through them, but I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and comments. And so I'm going to do my best to go through the uh, PowerPoint in a way that leaves plenty of time for questions. So start thinking of things you want to ask or, or just your own experiences you'd like to share. So let's start the slideshow or the PowerPoint presentation. Thanks so much for that. Um, and that, thanks, we'll go right to the, the next slide. Um, so the just for a minute about who we are. We're Trust for America's Health and we're a Washington DC based group and we work on policy issues at the federal level with the executive branch and the legislative branches. Um, and we also work with states and local uh, governments and health departments to promote health. And we do that policy development communications and government relations. So I'd start by saying that because we're, uh, we're in Washington and we have access to policymakers and we think about policy a lot. All too often though, when you're working on policy issues uh, in Washington, or, or frankly, that's true at any senior policymaking levels, it's really easy to get separated from what's the, the nitty gritty of what you're talking about. If you put that policy in place, what does it look like when it's implemented on the ground? And so I'd like to start uh, and end this uh, presentation by trying to root it in the reality of a real person. Next slide, please. So uh, let me introduce you to Mrs. Johnson. She's a real person. This is not uh, her photograph and I've changed her name. Um, but she represents a, a lot of Americans. She's, you know, in her 60s and she has some health risks, smoking uh, her weight. She, she has some health uh, diagnoses already. She's asthmatic and pre-diabetic and, and she's on, had on it even medical care. Her, her husband has dementia. You know, and when in the past when we would focus our attention on what does it take to get uh, to have someone be as healthy as possible, we'd really focus on what is the what are her clinical care needs? Can we get her a good doctor? Can we make sure she has insurance? 
the ACA really helped in terms of that, but it clearly didn't meet all of her needs, even when she had very good care, even when she got health insurance and she was receiving assistance from uh, a skilled caring clinician, she wasn't in the best health. And next slide. And, and that had a lot to do with the fact that, you, you know, our health, as you all know, is, is um, a result of a lot of different things. And, and just to look at Mrs. Johnson in terms of her, H, her COVID-19 risks, uh, clearly her age and her health make her uh, uh, more of a risk in terms of serious illness and death. But, but she also had these other conditions in her life that weren't about that those factors, they were about social and economic factors. Uh, she worked in a grocery store. So she was one of those people we used to call essential workers. We're not treating them that way now, but we used to, and we recognize that people who work in grocery stores were at elevated risk because of their interactions with the public. She also relied on mass transit, she didn't have a car. So she had to take mass transit. There were risks involved in that. And she also had uh, uh, some conditions in her home that, that elevated her risk. It made her asthma more, um, more of a problem. And she also lived with others in a relatively crowded apartment so that even if she was trying her best to take all the steps necessary to protect herself from COVID, she had other people in her house who were out working or going to school. And so her exposure was high. So I, I relay this story because it, this is really about the social determinants of health. Once we move beyond her age and her health, it's a really about the social and economic conditions that were the major factors. Next. And there are just lots of Mrs. To Mrs. Johnson. There's, you know, there are, there are millions of people who are more or less in that kind of a situation where you can say, wear a mask, keep social distancing, and it, it just isn't enough given the risks that they face as a result of the social and economic conditions over which they have very little control. Next slide, please. Uh, and just quickly, you know, I'm sure this, the, the data that illustrate this, the, this, this just shows the elevated um, risk of serious illness by race, and you see it's much higher for uh, people of color. Uh, and, and the underlying reasons for that had a lot to do with the social determinants of health. Next, please. And, and we see the same kind of um, differences if we look by income. The, the poorer you are, as this shows you, the more likely that you are going to develop um, serious illness from COVID. Uh, the wealthier you are, the more likely it wasn't going to, you weren't going to develop serious illness if you were infected with COVID. So clearly COVID just has reinforced what we already know for when we looked at chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease uh, and other infectious diseases like HIV. Um, and when we look at infant mortality, the conditions in one's life really end up being the deciding factors in uh, whether or not you're optimizing your health or you're at elevated risk. Next. We don't always know what we mean though when we hear people referring to social determinants of health and uh, social determinants of health, if you're in a discussion with people from different organizations, you can be using the same language and really meaning very different things. Uh, th this is a chart that I think illustrates what some of those uh, what is sometimes meant uh, by social determinants by looking at uh, income, um, the the quality of conditions in a neighborhood, educational, economic opportunities, uh, ability to have some some core uh, needs met, like a roof over your head or uh, adequate food. So, really looking, um, but but what I would say is. Even when we think of these categories, we may be talking about different things when we're talking about social determinants. Next. This is a, a chart that, uh, or a visual that um, uh, I find very helpful in terms of really clarifying what we mean by social determinants of health. It looks at this notion of being upstream and downstream and determining where you're going to work if you're going to be working on health. Um, you know, clearly uh, people that are focused on treating um, folks who are diagnosed with COVID, who are showing signs of, uh, of 
um, symptoms that are significant, if they're getting good care, one could say that that care is preventing them from getting um, more ill, and that's incredibly important. Um, if you're, and that's, so that's, we call that a downstream approach. You're, you're seeing someone once they're sick, you're providing them with the, the care that they need so that they don't get um, any sicker. Um, the, the, in the midstream, that's where some of the confusion exists because in midstream, often what we're dealing with in, uh, in this model is what I refer to as a social need. Uh, so you, you, you may identify someone who um, is, um, um, has problem with food, uh, sufficient food in their diet or healthy food in their diet or, or someone who's uh, falling behind on their rent and maybe losing um, their uh, apartment. Uh, when, when we see folks like that, if uh, what we do is try to intervene and address the immediate issue, you know, do, you, can, do we have a food pantry? Can we give you a bag full of food? Or you know, can, can we help you get through your rent for the next 30 days with some sort of assistance? Um, those are meeting the social needs. Really important to do that. It, that may keep someone alive in their house, uh, out of the hospital, um, you know, and so we want to definitely do that. But we wouldn't refer to, in my organization, we wouldn't refer to those um, conditions that I was mentioning as um, the social determinants. We would re we'd refer to those as more of the, the symptoms, the, the underlying symptoms are related to a multi-generational poverty. They're related to uh, the impact of systemic racism and other forms of discrimination. And, and so we don't solve the problems that someone has if they have um, unstable housing or insufficient food by helping them out uh, in the short term, we, we may get them through the next few days, which is really important. I don't want to dismiss that, but solving the problem really needs, we need to think more deeply about what are the solutions? How do we, how do we address those uh, problems so that the person's, it doesn't have to worry any longer about on a month to month basis, are they going to be homeless? Or I've got enough food this week, but I don't know where it's coming from next week. Moving more upstream is, um, is from our perspective, what the, the core meaning of a social determinant is. Next, please. Now, um, when this notion of social determinants arose, and it's really only, I'd say, in the last 10 years that people are talking a lot about social determinants. In the past, people definitely talked about racism or poverty, but, um, but the notion of there being a social determinant of health is kind of a relatively new concept, I'd say, in the last decade. And um, when it first arose, I think a lot of folks thought, well, maybe this is not going to be something that's embraced on both sides of the aisle or thought of as something that every different sector has to get, uh, pay some attention to. But increasingly, we're finding that to be the case. So here, here's an example of that. Um, that in pre-COVID, just some of the national policy approaches to uh, increasing work on the social determinants of health. Uh, within the uh, CMS, Medicaid and Medicare, there was a program called Accountable Health Communities, where it was a pilot that uh, the intent of which was to see, do uh, are people's health better if they're screened routinely for whether there are problems with the social determinants, housing, food, safety, et cetera, um, and with some effort to connect them to uh, a local agencies that might help them. So that's a whole, whole um, pilot program that's now many years in the process that's already showing positive signs in Medicare and Medicare, Medicaid. I'm sorry, Medicaid, not Medicare. Um, uh, Medicare, though, itself, uh, in the last administration, um, uh, acknowledged that there were some things that Medicare should be paying for related to transportation and food that were a recognition of the social determinants of health. And then there are other examples as well, the National Academies of um, Sciences, Engineering and Medicine uh, had a whole day session that the uh, previous administration's Department of Health and Human Services uh, organized to try to get uh, more feedback on what uh, federal policies could address social determinants. 
And, and there's a whole coalition now, the National Alliance for Impact and Social Determinants of Health that works on this, um, which and works on very much on both sides of the aisle. Next slide. So, so now I want to move, I, I'm assuming you all know a fair amount about the social determinants. So now I want to move to the, to a, um, a, to share with you some examples of what it may mean to start to work on this uh, at a, a federal level. And what would it mean to make policy changes that made it easier for, in particular, the public health sector to work in collaboration with other sectors at the local and the state level to try to address the social determinants. Because we're very interested in moving away from recognizing that the social determinants are a problem to understanding what can be done. And if we know it's a problem, why aren't we doing more? And so I'll give you a couple of examples of things we're involved in. We, um, this is a cover sheet for a project that we've been working on just for the last month. Um, and it came out of the work that we're doing um, to look for gaps in the COVID-19 work. And one of the gaps that was identified early on was um, uh, in the vaccination, uh, of the COVID vaccination process, that even though there was a lot of attention that was being paid to older adults who were in skilled nursing facilities, there was very little attention, relatively speaking, to the older adults and people with disabilities at the same level as in a nursing home, but people who lived in their own home and were cared for by either family members or, um, or uh, paid healthcare workers. And this was a, um, captured a, a disproportionately uh, large number of people who were low income, um, who, um, um, didn't always have uh, insurance coverage that would cover all of their needs, had some coverage, usually Medicare, for example, very often, but a lot of things weren't covered. And, and even as they would um, look at where vaccinations were, it wasn't going to be easy or possible for them to get to a vaccination site. It was just too complicated and it involved too many issues. Uh, in some cases, it was someone living in a rural area. There was no mass transportation. It was long distances to a vaccination site. The person's health was very fragile. So we've taken a deep dive in this area of work. We're, we're meeting with federal officials. We're meeting with people on the front lines who want to work with this population. Um, and we're um, uh, developing recommendations around policies that take into effect, into, into effect the uh, social and economic barriers. Next, please. Earlier, we uh, had a, a project. Uh, this one occurred in October of 2020, where we recognized that vaccines for COVID were soon going to be um, made available, but that there had been very little planning at the community level to reach um, people who were at elevated risk, uh, and in particular, in this case, we were looking at uh, people of color in tribal nations. Um, the, the, the work that had been done uh, at that time was really focused on uh, developing the vaccines, producing the vaccines, putting them in a truck when they were available, and sending them to a state depot. And there wasn't a recognition that, um, at the federal level, that there needed to be a lot of attention to determine how do you get the vaccine from a centralized depot in a state into people's communities, uh, into the, the arms of people who, uh, for a lot of reasons, have um, uh, significant either concerns uh, about vaccines, access to vaccines, um, or, uh, or, or other um, issues that would arise. Uh, so one of the issues that arose, which I think very much relates to social determinants of health, as we convened this meeting, we, we did this together with UNIDOS US and the National Medical Association that represents African American physicians. And most of the groups that were there were groups of color. And the groups really identified that, you know, we were not just dealing with uh, COVID-19 and trust in vaccinations. We, we were dealing with uh, the legacy of uh, slavery and racism in the country. We were dealing with decades and decades of discrimination and racism against uh, other populations, uh, including um, uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives. And that, 
it wasn't possible just to think, is there going to be a, a good advertisement for the vaccine or should we just open up a mass vaccine clinic um, to overcome those concerns? Those concerns are what we refer to as social determinants of health. If you don't trust the medical profession because your experience has been uh, that it uh, discriminates against you, uh, then you're not going to be willing to get, in this instance, uh, a vaccine. And so the recommendations really had to do with uh, considering uh, what were the ways of, um, in a relatively short amount of time, um, looking to the trusted members of the communities, um, providing them with resources and information and support so that they could work with other members in their community to uh, to try to overcome the understandable distrust and provide useful information so that people could get the the um, prevention services they need. Next, um, we when we think about what the systemic problems are that get in the way of working on social determinants of health, uh, we um, look at the public health system and how it's functioning. And I'm a public health guy, and I would say to you that my colleagues at the local, state, and federal level have been talking for years now about the social determinants of health. But if you look at the actual work that they're doing at local, state, and federal levels, it's really not so focused on addressing those. People know it's important. They're not able to focus on that. Why is that? So we did an analysis, and some of the obstacles were that uh, public health is just underfunded and, and that if it doesn't have staff, sufficient staff, if it doesn't have staff who have the right kind of skills, if the budgets keep going down or they only go up in the midst of a short, uh, for a short period of time in an emergency, you, you won't have the flexibility to begin to work um, for, uh, with other sectors on, uh, and with the members of the community on addressing the social determinants. So underfunding, major issue. Second issue is uh, public health is funded based upon um, diseases or conditions. It's not uh, focused on uh, populations and it's not focused on looking at social and economic conditions. So if you're funded so you have specific money for diabetes or HIV or tobacco and you can only spend your dollars on those conditions, it's much less likely you can work on the social determinants of health because they don't fit. It doesn't quite fit. Uh, I used to work on, for instance, when I was a state health official on transportation issues, and they were very important for people's overall health, but I couldn't say it was one specific illness and only that illness that um, should be funding the work. I needed generalized funding, didn't have that. And it's also just the, the fact that people in public health are, are worried about what is our role? How do we contribute when the work we're contributing may not even be in the public health sector? It may be, can we affect what's happening in uh, um, schools or the economy or uh, public safety? Uh, there is this fear of, of boiling the ocean. How can we work on poverty? How can we work on racism? I felt that as a local health official. But the truth is now we have to do that. And luckily there's some tools and there's some examples that help us in terms of making um, some progress. Next. So I'm gonna share with you some examples of where you can find useful tools if you want to work on social determinants of health. Um, health Impact in Five Years or High Five was developed by the Centers for Disease Control about five years ago. And its goal was to have a federally endorsed project that would identify policy changes that could be made uh, at the state or the local level that had a proven history of improving health in five years or less, that's the high five part of it, and to have a positive impact on reducing cost. Uh, what the, the process for identifying those meant looking at thousands of different policies and finding the ones that the research definitively met the criteria I just mentioned. And fortunately, what they found was a number of the policies were policies that affected the social determinants of health. So for example, there's, they found solid evidence that uh, earned income tax credits and funding uh, for people to um, 
that are uh, low income um, homeowners to to do renovations were strongly correlate, correlated with improved health in five years or less and reducing costs. So for Mrs. Johnson, again, if there's money to get the asthma out of her um, apartment, that is very much going to be helpful in terms of her proving her health through uh, low income loans um, to um, um, for uh, renovating um, housing. If uh, earned income tax credit means she's got additional dollars, that can help in terms of buying healthier foods or alternative forms of transportation. So if you're interested, Google High Five CDC, and you'll see packets that are prepared to convince policymakers. They're really designed with that in mind. If you're an elected official, you're running in four years, you want to show something, here's something that in all likelihood will show results before you run again. And it's Think of it as a sure thing. Next. Uh, a, a second tool that is one that uh, Trust for America's Health, my organization developed, uh, that was specifically for states. It's called Promoting Health and Cost Control in States, or FACTS. And it came up with these 13 different policies, which again had solid evidence of effectiveness. The research showed changing some of those social and economic conditions would improve health. This having something like this and high five as a way of overcoming that fear of what can we do? We, we can't boil the ocean. Where do we start? How do we have an impact? So the way to have an impact is to say we in public health have knowledge about what can work. If you need it to work quickly because you're worried about running for office, Mr. Governor or Mayor, here's high five. That will likely result by the time you run again. If you're working at a go at a state level of the governor, here is a packet of information that is uh, policy by policy designed to help you in making these decisions. Next, please. And and a third area where that same uh, approach was taken is known as city health. It has you can't see it because it's too small, but it has nine policies that are evidence based and have been shown. If you pass those policies. Um, they will result in improved health, and it has to do with uh, certain kinds of transportation, uh, income, uh, and a variety of other factors. So again, the, the idea here is let's move towards being able to work on social determinants of health by thinking practically, what do we need? These three tools are examples of, um, you don't have to figure it out on your own. There are government endorsed policies that affect the social determinants that are related to health, work on those. Next. And then we also like to show that there are examples where you can uh, work on this and overcome some of those obstacles like disease specific line items. Uh, in Rhode Island, the health department uh, uh, or said that community groups, coalitions of groups in Rhode Island could set their own priorities. What is the main health issue they want to work on? Uh, often those are issues, not the ones that might come to mind at first slide that are related to uh, a particular disease. It may, it's more likely that those issues uh, are things like affordable housing um, or um, safe neighborhoods. Um, so they uh, came up with a, an approach that allowed the community to identify its priorities. And then behind the scenes, the health department looked at its disease specific line items and negotiated with the funding source, in this case CDC, some additional flexibility that allowed them to pull pieces of those different line items together uh, and, um, and um, give them in a grant to these community driven approaches. Next. I'll talk to you about some of the work we're doing now with um, at the federal level with Congress as an example of how we're also trying to uh, work behind the scenes to uh, make it more possible to get uh, to actually be um, uh, uh, making a difference on social determinants in each of the states. Uh, we are working on ensuring that um, that underfunding gets addressed by supporting an infrastructure bill uh, that would add 4.5 billion dollars a year, not just during a pandemic, but every year to the CDC's budget to pay for local, state, tribal and territorial public health infrastructure. 
this is not the disease specific work, but it's it's uh, improving data systems, improving knowledge of policy, uh, working on communication skills. Um, the infrastructure that's necessary to work on any of those issues, including the social determinants. And then we've also supported some specific line items that we think help um, public health sector get away from getting funding that's only going to be disease specific. We have supported the creation for the first time at CDC of a social determinants of health line item. And we suggest that states and locals do this as well. Uh, we uh, proposed a $50 million line item, which was not that much money when we considered how much was needed, but that would give every state uh, something like a $400,000 grant to hire specialists in such areas as housing, um, uh, economic uh, concerns, uh, food insecurity, et cetera. Um, and it would fund uh, many big cities as well. Uh, we weren't successful in getting the 50 million, but remarkably within the first year that we were proposing a brand new line item, that line item was funded for 3 million. That may not seem like much to you, but Congress moves are really slowly. It often will take several years between the time you suggest a new approach and the time that uh, elected officials are comfortable enough to actually put money behind it. So uh, getting $3 million out of the gates is pretty good. And we've got uh, in the current session of Congress, we have um, already uh, a number of uh, members of Congress have introduced a proposal to get us up to that $50 million level. We also uh, have proposed uh, a focus on older adults that would look specifically at the conditions in people's lives when they're older that either make them healthier or less healthy. Uh, this means working on such things as transportation and social isolation and access to nutritional foods um, and um, um, uh, 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 transportation, a, lot, a number of different issues. And again, there too, we made progress in the first year. Uh, the House voted to add, create a new line item at CDC and add $10 million to it. Uh, we didn't get it through the Senate. But the fact that in the first year we proposed it, the House was willing to um, put $10 million in it is a sign that we can, if we focus people's attention, we can make progress in getting funding. By the way, that, that age-friendly line item was it had bipartisan support, both Republican and Democrat. And we're focusing a lot of our attention and talking to policymakers about the lessons from COVID because COVID has illustrated to a number of policymakers that those social and economic conditions make a difference. The, the, the conditions of the grocery store workers or the transportation people put them at greater risk. That awareness gives us an opening to talk more uh, specifically about social determinants. Uh, a final point I have here is about data modernization. That might not seem to you to be related to social determinants, but um, we don't, with our data systems now, collect consistent, accurate information on race, ethnicity, or income. And if we're going to be able to develop policies that pay particular attention to addressing uh, systemic racism, multi-generational poverty, we've got to have better data that allows us to do that. And so there's a, a, a strong emphasis in our work and the work of others with uh, members of Congress and the administration to strengthen data systems so that that kind of information is routinely collected. Just as one example, uh, with COVID, we only know about 54% of the races and uh, ethnicities of people who uh, get COVID, get hospitalized, die, or are getting vaccinated. So just a little more than half. We know age, 90% plus. We know gender, 90% plus. But the critical information about race and ethnicity, only about half of the time do we collect that. Next. Um, so the, there's some specialized work that we're doing on COVID that focuses on social determinants. I'll just mention a couple where, where we support uh, SNAP or food stamps growing um, and becoming um, um, both more generous in terms of what's allowable under SNAP, but also um, more uh, available to uh, Americans who 
um, are uh, out of work or whose income is um, decreasing. Uh, we're pushing very hard for paid sick leave to be a national policy. Uh, only about 50% of workers in America have paid sick leave. Uh, and that has serious consequences clearly in a pandemic because people will go to work if they're sick if the alternative is not having enough money to feed their family or pay um, or pay rent. Um, we are also working on issues related to uh, the uh, criminal justice system and, um, and the steps that need to be taken there to um, to provide alternatives to arrest, to provide uh, uh, appropriately training of police. Um, uh, to their, what are known as diversion courts that give people an option of not going into uh, the criminal justice system if what is related to their being accused of a crime is uh, um, either a mental health issue or um, a substance use disorder. So we're working on many different fronts in COVID, but hoping to say to um, uh, members of Congress and at the state and local level. Let's learn the lessons. Let's start some innovative things now, but continue them post COVID. Next. So in closing, before we open it up for questions and answers, I would just bring it back uh, to uh, Mrs. Johnson. Uh, our goal in Mrs. Johnson's life is not just to get her good care. We, we want that. That's, that is necessary, but insufficient. If we're really going to uh, make it possible for her to have optimal health. She needs to be able to live in a neighborhood that's safe where she doesn't have to worry about uh, either police violence or uh, criminal violence, where she uh, can make a, um, an, a living with, that's an affordable living that allows her to pay for the essential um, uh, uh, needs of her family, um, that she can either have uh, the apartment she's in renovated so it won't exacerbate her asthma, or she can move to an apartment that uh, where the conditions would be better. We've got to work on those underlying conditions, and the true test of any policy we're developing is whether or not it's going to reach her and other people like her and uh, give her the chance to leave the health, lead the healthiest life that's possible. Mm -hmm.